In this introduction video, we're going to cover some basic concepts in physics. We're going to talk about unit conversion, kinematics, vectors, projectile motion, forces like Newton's three laws, circular motion, work and energy, linear momentum, and also rotational motion. Now, we won't go too deep in, into each of these topics, but we're just going to go over these topics briefly, just a nice, simple, brief overview. And if you want more examples on a particular topic, feel free to go to my channel and look for my physics playlist. You should find a lot of practice problems for each of these uh, different topics. So let's go ahead and begin. Let's start with unit conversions. Now, you need to know that one kilogram is equal to 1,000 grams. These are some common conversions that you need to know that you're going to use frequently when you're solving problems in physics. One kilometer is equivalent to a thousand meters. Right now it might be wise just to take notes. One mile is equal to 5,280 feet. One inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. And there's 12 inches in a foot, and there's three feet in a single yard. Also, one meter is equivalent to 100 centimeters. Now, let's work on a practice problem. Let's say if we have a mass of 470 grams, and we wish to convert it to kilograms. How can we do so? The first thing you want to do is write the conversion factor that connects grams to kilograms. We know that a thousand grams is equivalent to one kilogram. So always start with what you have. So we have 470 grams of mass. By the way, the standard unit of mass is the kilogram. So in a typical physics problem, if you're solving an equation or using an equation and it has mass in it, make sure that you uh, plug in the mass in kilograms, not in grams. In the second fraction, we're going to put the conversion factor in it. Since we have grams on top, we need to make sure the unit grams um, goes on the bottom so that they will cancel. And kilograms has to go on top. So a thousand is associated with the number of grams, and one is associated with the kilograms. So if you set it this way, you should get it right. So it's going to be 470 divided by 1,000, which is equal to 0.47 kilograms. So that's how you can convert grams into kilograms. So I'm just going to give you common examples that you'll see throughout uh, physics as you solve problems in the future. So let's try this one. How would you convert centimeters to meters? So feel free to pause the video and work on this particular example. So first, what is the conversion factor between centimeters and meters? We know that 100 centimeters is equal to a single meter. So let's start with what we're given. That is 4.6 centimeters. And let's convert it to meters. So since we have the unit centimeters on top, in the next fraction, we're going to put centimeters on the bottom so that it cancels, which means that we need to put meters on top. The number that's in front of centimeters is 100, and the number that's in front of meters is 1. So to convert from centimeters to meters, simply divide by 100. So this is going to be 0 0.046 meters. Whenever you divide by 100, simply move the decimal two units to the left. Go ahead and try this one. How can we convert 25 kilometers per hour into meters per second? So you might see a problem like this whenever you're dealing with speed. And if you have the units kilometers per hour and you're using an equation that involves speed or velocity, make sure you convert it to meters per second. 
99% of the time you'll need it in this unit. So what can we do to convert it? So there's two parts in this problem. We need to convert kilometers into meters and we need to convert hours into seconds. So let's go ahead and begin. So we have 25 kilometers on top and one hour in the bottom because there's two units here. So we already know the conversion between kilometers and meters. One kilometer we know is equal to a thousand meters. So let's put meters on top, kilometers on the bottom so that these two units will cancel. Now what about hours into seconds? Well it turns out that one hour is equivalent to 60 minutes. So we have the unit hours on the bottom. We need to put that on the top so that these will cancel. And we can put minutes on the bottom. So one hour is equivalent to 60 minutes. And it turns out that one minute is equivalent to 60 seconds. So these two cancel. So the only unit that we should have left is meters over seconds, or meters per second. And so now we can do the math. So let's take out a calculator. It's going to be 25 divided by 1,000. Wait, I did something wrong. The 1,000 should be on top, not on the bottom. It's very easy to make a mistake, but it's always good to catch it. 1 is in front of kilometers, and 1,000 is in front of meters. So it should be 25 times 1,000 divided by 60, and then take that result divided by 60 again. So you should have 6.94 meters per second. So this is the answer. Let's try another problem like that. Convert 50 miles per hour into meters per second. So go ahead and work on this example. So let's begin. So we're going to have 50 miles on top and per one hour on the bottom. So we know how to go from hours to minutes to seconds. We did so in the last example. But now let's focus on miles. We need to convert miles into meters. What's the best way to do that? What would you suggest? We could go from miles to feet to inches to centimeters to meters to kilometers. But that, that's going to be a long route. We have everything to do that. But if you know the conversion between miles and kilometers, that will save you a lot of time. And then from kilometers, you can go to meters. It turns out that one kilometer, if I recall correctly, is about 0.6214 miles. And also uh, one mile is 1.609 kilometers. So let's go ahead and use that conversion. So one kilometer equals 0.6214 miles. So these units will cancel. Now that we have kilometers we can convert it to meters. We know that there's a thousand meters for every kilometer. So now we have the desired unit meters. So now let's focus on hours. Let's convert it to minutes. One hour equals 60 minutes and one minute equals uh, 60 seconds. So the unit hours cancel and also minutes cancel. So we're left with just meters on top, seconds on the bottom. So let's go ahead and get the answer. So it's going to be 50 divided by 0.6214 times 1,000 divided by 60, and then divide that result by 60 as well. So the answer that I got is 22.35 meters per second. Let me just double check that and make sure I typed in everything correctly. And yeah, I believe that's the answer, so I don't think I made a mistake here. And so this should be it. Now you know how to convert miles per hour into meters per second. 
Now let's talk about units of length, area, and volume. Distance, for example, is a unit of length. So like the meter is the typical unit of length for area, it's going to be square meters. And in the case of volume, volume is three-dimensional, so it's uh, cubic meters. So let's say if you have uh, feet. Area could be described as square feet, volume, cubic feet. Or you could measure units of length such as, uh, let's say, centimeters. This could be square centimeters in the case of area, or cubic centimeters in the case of volume. So let's say if you wish to convert from one unit of area to another. How can we do so? How can we convert 36 square feet into, let's say, square yards? How can we do that? What would you do in order to accomplish this uh, conversion? So always start with what you're given, 36 square feet. And then simply convert feet into yards. Now we know that one yard is equivalent to three feet. So since we have the unit feet on top, we need to put it on the bottom. And so yards is going to go on top. And there's three feet and one yard. Now notice that we have the square. All we need to do is simply square the conversion factor. So we're not going to divide 36 by 3 we're going to divide 36 by 3 squared, and 3 squared is 9. 36 divided by 9 is 4. So the answer is 4 yards squared. So that's how you can convert from one unit of area to another. So now what about volume? So based on what you've seen in the last example, try this one. Convert 288 cubic inches into cubic feet. So we know that there's 12 inches in a foot. And since we have inches on the top left, we need to put it in the bottom right. And all we need to do is raise the conversion factor to the third power. So we have 288, and we're just going to divide it by 12 three times. If we divide it by 12 the first time, it's going to give us 24. If we divide 24 by 12, it will equal 2. And if we divide 2 by 12, it's 1 over 6, or 0.167 cubic feet. So now you know how to convert from one unit of volume into another unit. Now the next topic that we need to talk about is the metric system. Perhaps you heard of terms like mega, micro, nano. You need to know what these prefixes mean. Terra is associated with 10 to the 12. Let's put some space between these two. Mega is associated with, before mega, there's giga, which is associated with 10 to the 9. And then you have mega, which is 10 to the 6. And then there's kilo. 10 to the 3, and then hecto, 10 to the 2, and then deca, which is 10 to the first power. So you need to know what this means. So 1 terameter is equivalent to 1 times 10 to the 12 meters. On the left you have the prefix, on the right you have your base unit. So let's say the base unit is liters. 1 gigaliter is equal to 1 times 10 to the 9 of the base unit liters. Let's say if we have uh, units of frequency, hertz. 1 megahertz is equal to 1 times 10 to the 6 of the base unit hertz. 1 kilometer is 1 times 10 to the 3 meters. 10 to the 3 is basically 1 with 3 zeros, or as we mentioned before, 1 kilometer is 1,000 meters. 
10 to the 6 is 1 with 6 zeros. So a megahertz is a million hertz. A gigaliter is a billion liters. So you need to be able to use this table to write a conversion factor. Now below deca, which is 10 to the 1, we have our base unit. And below that, you have deci, which is 10 to the minus 1. And then there's centi, which is 10 to the minus 2. And then milli, that's 10 to the minus 3. Micro is 10 to the negative 6. Nano is 10 to the negative 9. Pico is 10 to the minus 12. So these are the common values. There are some other ones, like atto, uh, femto, and some other variations, but I'm just going to stop at pico. So one milliliter is equal to one times 10 to the minus three liters. If you multiply both sides by a thousand, you'll see that a thousand milliliters is equal to one liter. One nanometer is equal to one times 10 to the minus nine of the base unit meters. So as you can see, there's always a one on the left side. And on the right side, it's gonna be one times whatever the multiply is of that base unit. So make sure you know how to use this so you're able to write a conversion factor. So now let's work on some examples. Let's convert 4.3 times 10 to the minus four millimeters into micrometers. So Go ahead and pause the video, take a minute to work on this example. When converting from one unit to another in a metric system, personally I find it's helpful to convert to the base unit and then convert to your desired unit. It helps if you do that. We know the conversion between millimeters and meters. Milli represents 10 to the minus 3. So we could say that 1 millimeter is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Micro is 10 to the negative 6. So 1 micrometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. And these are the two conversion factors that we need in order to complete this problem. So let's begin. Let's start with 4.3 times 10 to the minus 4 millimeters. Now let's convert millimeters into the base unit meters. So we need to put millimeters on the bottom. So 1 millimeter is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. So these units will cancel. Now that we have the base unit meters, let's convert it to micrometers. Now, since meters is on the top left, we got to put meters on the bottom right. 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters is equivalent to 1 micrometer. So at this point, we just need to work on the math. We really don't need a calculator for these types of problems. Now, we know that 1 over x to the negative 3 is the same as x to the positive 3, if you've taken algebra at this point. Whenever you move a variable from the bottom to the top, or vice versa, the exponent will change sign, in this case, from negative 3 to positive 3. So we could take this number, move it to the top. The negative 6 will change into positive 6. So what we have is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 4 times 10 to the minus 3 times 10 to the positive 6. We can ignore the 1's because when you multiply or divide by 1, the number does not change. Now, x squared times x cubed is x to the fifth power, according to the rules of algebra. When you multiply by a common base, you are allowed to add the exponents. 2 plus 3 is 5. So here, we can add these exponents. Negative 4 plus negative 3 is negative 7 negative 7 plus 6 is negative 1. So the final answer is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 1 micrometers. So let's go ahead and try another example. Try this one. Convert 2.6 times 10 to the 11 micrometers into kilometers. So let's write out the conversion factors. Let's convert micrometers to meters and then meters to kilometers. One micrometer is one times 10 to the minus six meters. And one kilometer 
is 10 to the 3 meters or simply a thousand meters. So let's begin with the unit that we have which is uh, micrometers. So one micrometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. So we can cross out those two units. And now let's convert meters into kilometers. We know that 1,000 meters, or let's divide it in scientific notation, 1 times 10 to the 3 meters is equivalent to 1 kilometer. So what we're going to do is take this number and move it to the top. So it's 2.6 times 10 to the 11 times 10 to the minus 6. And then the positive 3 will change to negative 3. And then let's add the exponents. So 11 plus negative 6 is uh, positive 5. Positive 5 plus negative 3 is positive 2. So it's 2.6 times 10 to the 2 kilometers. 10 squared, 10 times 10, that's 100. So 2.6 times 100, we can also say it's 260 uh, kilometers. Now let's move on to a new topic. Let's talk about the difference between distance and displacement. Now let's say if a person travels 10 miles east, the displacement is positive 10 initially. And then let's say he travels 18 miles west. The displacement for the second part is negative 18. And then he travels, let's say, 3 miles east. What is the displacement of the person? And also, what is the total distance traveled? Now imagine if we started from a number line, and he started at position 0. He traveled 10 meters to the right, or 10 miles to the right, so he's at position 10, and then 18 miles to the left, or towards the west. So 10 minus 18, that means he's at negative 8. And then 3 miles east, negative 8 plus 3, that means he would end at negative 5. So he started at 0, and he ended at negative 5, which means that the displacement of the person is negative 5. He's 5 miles west from where he started. That's the displacement. You can simply add these three values. If you add 10, negative 18, positive 3, you're going to get negative 5. So at the end of his trip, he's 5 miles west from where he started. That's the displacement. The total distance traveled, you simply add the three values. You add 10 and 3 and positive 18 instead of negative 18. So if you add these three values, this will give you 31. So the total distance traveled is 31 miles, but the displacement is negative 5. Distance is a scalar quantity. It only has magnitude. Distance is always positive. Direction is not important for distance. Displacement is a vector quantity, meaning that not only does it have magnitude, but it also has direction. So let's say if a person travels 12 miles north, not only you have the magnitude, which is the 12 miles, but you also have the direction, which is north. So this represents displacement. Now, let's say if a person travels only 8 miles. We don't know where he's going. It could be east, west, south. If you only have the magnitude, then what you have described there is the distance, not the displacement. Displacement is distance with direction. Now, you need to be able to calculate average speed and average velocity. Average speed is equal to the total distance traveled divided by the total time. Average velocity is equal to the displacement divided by the total time. So speed, like distance, is a scalar quantity. 
Speed is always positive. Direction is not important for speed. Velocity is a vector quantity. It can be positive or negative. So if a person is traveling east, the velocity is positive. If they're traveling west, it's negative. A car travels 100 miles north in 2 hours and then 40 miles south in 1 hour. Calculate the total distance traveled, the displacement, average speed, and average velocity. So let's begin. Let's start with the total distance. To find the total distance, simply add up the distance of each segment of the trip. So 100 plus 40, the total distance is simply 140 miles. Now what about the displacement? By the way, feel free to pause the video and work on this example. So the car traveled 100 miles north, so in a positive y direction, the displacement is positive 100. Then he turns around and travels 40 miles south with a displacement of negative 40. So we need to add these two values. 100 plus negative 40 is positive 60. So the net displacement of the car is 60 miles north. Now what about part C, the average speed? The average speed is equal to the total distance traveled divided by the total time. The total distance traveled is 140 miles. The total time is 2 hours plus an hour, so that's 3 hours total. 140 divided by 3 is about 46. 0.7 miles per hour. Now what about the average velocity? So the average velocity is equal to the displacement, which is positive 60, divided by the total time of 3 hours. So this is going to be positive 20 miles per hour. So that's it. Now you know how to calculate average speed and average velocity. Now what about average acceleration? What is the equation for that? Now what exactly is acceleration? Acceleration tells you how fast the velocity changes. Acceleration is equal to the change in velocity, that is the final velocity minus the initial velocity, divided by the time. Now let's say if we have if there's two vehicles, a sports car and a truck. The sports car can get to a speed of 60 miles per hour, and so can the truck. Speed tells you how fast an object is moving. But acceleration tells you how fast the speed changes. The sports car can go from 0 to 60 miles per hour in a very short time. It can probably do so within 5 seconds. The truck is going to take a longer time to go from 0 to 60. It might take 10 or 15 seconds. So therefore, the sports car has a greater acceleration than the truck. Even though they can both get up to the same speed, the sports car can get to 60 miles per hour a lot faster than the truck, and so it has a greater acceleration. And acceleration is basically the rate of change of velocity. It tells you how fast your velocity is changing. Now sometimes you may want to use this equation. If you wish to calculate final speed, use this. So this equation comes from the acceleration equation. Go ahead and take a minute and try this problem. A car speeds up from 10 meters per second to 40 meters per second in 5 seconds. What is the acceleration of the car? So let's answer the first question. Acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. The final velocity, or final speed in this problem, is 40 meters per second. The initial is 10, and the time is 5 seconds. So the change in speed is 30 meters per second per 5 seconds. So 30 divided by 5, the change in speed per second is 5 meters per second squared. I mean 6 meters per second squared. So that is the acceleration. So what this tells us is that the speed is increasing by 6 meters per second every second. Now what about part B? What is the final speed of a truck 
that accelerates at a rate of 1.5 meters per second squared, starting from an initial speed of 20 meters per second for 8 seconds. So let's make a list of the information that we have. We have the acceleration. We're given the time. It's 8 seconds. And we also have the initial speed, which is uh, 20 meters per second. So our goal is to find the final speed. We can use this formula to calculate it. So the initial speed is 20, the acceleration is 1.5, and the time is 8. Now 1.5 times 8 is 12, and if we add 20 to it, this is going to give us 32. So the final speed is 32 meters per second. Now let's make sense of that last part. So we have an acceleration of 1.5 meters per second squared. The initial speed we said was uh, 20 meters per second. And the time was 8 seconds. And we calculated a final speed of 32 meters per second. Let's make a table. At t equals 0, the speed was 20. One second later, what will the speed be? Now keep in mind, the acceleration is 1.5 meters per second squared. That means every second, the speed will increase by 1.5 meters per second. So one second later, it's going to be 21.5. Two seconds later, 23. Three seconds later, 24.5. Four seconds later, it's going to be 26. Every second, it's going to go up by 1.5. Five seconds later, it's 27.5. Six seconds later, it's 29. And then seven seconds later, 30.5. Eight seconds later, then it's 32 which is what we have here. So as you can see, the acceleration tells you how much the speed changes every second. Make sure you understand that general concept of acceleration. That's what it is. Acceleration, like velocity, is a vector. Acceleration can be positive or negative. Whenever the acceleration is positive, the velocity is increasing. Whenever the acceleration is negative, the velocity is decreasing. Now let's go over a few kinematic equations that you need to know. Whenever the object is moving with constant speed, that is the acceleration is zero, there's only one equation that really applies. Displacement is equal to velocity multiplied by time. Now keep in mind, whenever an object moves from, let's say, position A to position B, and if it doesn't change direction, if it's moving straight, then distance and displacement are the same. So you can use this equation to calculate the displacement or the distance. The only time distance and displacement are not the same is if the object changes direction. If it moves to the right and to the left, or up, down, whenever it changes direction, that's when those two will vary. But for a one-dimensional kinematic problem, if you're asked to find the distance or displacement, you can use this. But technically speaking, D represents the displacement. It's just that the displacement equals the distance if the object doesn't change direction. Now, let's say if the object moves with constant acceleration. In this situation, here are the equations that you can use. So the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration multiplied by the time. The final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 times the acceleration times the displacement. The displacement is equal to the initial velocity multiplied by the time plus one half at squared and also the displacement 
is equal to the average velocity multiplied by time. So this is similar to the first equation that we just mentioned under constant speed, d equals vt. But under constant acceleration, you need to use the average speed. The average speed is basically the sum of the initial and the final speed divided by 2. So then this equation becomes d is equal to 1 half v initial plus v final multiplied by t. So those are the four kinematic equations that you need. Here's number 1 number two, number three, and number four. So these two are the same. Now keep in mind, the displacement is the change in position. It's the final position minus the initial position. It can be relative to the x-axis or relative to the y-axis. A car speeds up from rest at a constant rate of 3.5 meters per second squared for 12 seconds. How far does the car travel during this time? So let's make a list of what we have. We have the acceleration and the key is the unit. The units of acceleration is meters per second squared. So that's uh, 3.5. And we have the time. It's 12 seconds. We also have the initial speed. The fact that it speeds up from rest tells us that the initial speed is zero. So what equation do we need that will help us to find distance? What equation has a, t, v initial, and d? So the equation that we need is this one. v initial is zero, so this whole term is zero. And then everything else we could just plug in. So half of 3.5 is 1.75. 12 squared is 144. So we just got to multiply these two numbers. And you should get a distance of 252 meters. So now, what equation can we use to find the final speed, how fast it's moving after 12 seconds? There's two equations that we can use. We're going to use both of them. First, let's use the equation that we've used before. V initial is 0, the acceleration is 3.5, and T is 12. So using this equation, we're going to get 42 meters per second. Now we can also use this equation. Let's say if we didn't know uh, the time. V initial is still 0, the acceleration is 3.5, and the distance is 252. So 2 times 3.5 is 7, 7 times 252 is 1764, and if you take the square root of that to get V final, because we have a square here, this will give you the same answer, 42 meters per second. So as you can see, you have a lot of options, a lot of different equations that you can use. It helps if you make a list of the variables that you have and the variables that you need to find. Here's another problem that we could try. A bus speeds up from 15 meters per second to 35 meters per second in 8 seconds. How far does it travel during this time period? So let's make a list of the things that we have. The initial speed is 15 meters per second. The final speed is 35 meters per second. And the time is 8 seconds. So we need to find the distance that it travels. We can use this equation d equals 1 half v initial plus v final times t. So let's add the initial and the final speed and then we'll multiply by the time. So 15 plus 35 is 50 and half of 8 is equal to 4. And 4 times 50 is 200. So it's going to travel 200 meters. 
Now what about part B? What is the acceleration of the bus? Now if you recall the acceleration is the change in speed divided by the time. So the speed changes by 20. It goes from 15 to 35. So 20 divided by 8 is equal to 2.5 meters per second squared. So that's the acceleration. By the way, feel free to check out my channel and look for my uh, physics playlist if you want more examples on kinematic problems. Now let's talk about vectors. Adding and subtracting vectors. Let's say if we have a box and if we apply a force vector of 50 newtons towards the right, a force is basically a push or pull action. A force can be used to do work on an object. Now let's say if we apply a 50 newton force towards the right and a 30 newton force towards the left. What is the net force? The net force is basically the difference of these two forces. It's 50 minus 30 or positive 20. So there's a net force of 20 newtons directed towards the right. So whenever you're whenever you wish to add two vectors if the vectors are in the same direction, you can just add them directly. So in this case, to add these two vectors, we're just going to get a larger vector of 100 newtons. Now, if you have two vectors that are anti-parallel, or that are opposite to each other, then to add the two vectors, simply subtract them. This is going to be 100 minus 40. Uh, this is negative 40 because it's moving to the left. And so the net force is positive 60. Now, how can we add two vectors if they're perpendicular to each other? Let's say if this is a 30 newton force, and here we have a 40 newton force. What is the resultant vector or the sum of these two vectors? To draw it graphically, if you place the second vector, if you place the tail of the second vector to the head of the first vector, the resultant vector is going to be right here. Start it from the tail of the first vector to the head of the second. And if you draw it in that direction, that's the resultant vector. So to find the magnitude of the resultant vector, you basically have to find the hypotenuse of the triangle. So it's going to be the square root of 30 squared plus 40 squared. If you recall, this is A, this is B, that's C. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. So C is the square root of A squared plus B squared. The square root of 30 squared plus 40 squared is 50. So the hypotenuse, or the resultant vector, is 50. So let's say if we have a velocity vector v. You can resolve it into components. This is vx, the x component of v, and vy. So if the velocity is moving in this direction, it's not only moving to the right, but it's also moving up at the same time. Now there are four equations that you need to know. And here's the angle theta. To find vx from v, vx is equal to v cosine theta. Vy is v sine theta. V is the square root of Vx squared plus Vy squared. And to find theta, it's equal to the inverse tangent of Vy over Vx. Now let's explain how to get these equations, if you're not sure about it. Perhaps you heard of the term Sokotoa. Chances are, if you have taken trig, you've seen this at some point. The so part refers to the sine function. Sine theta is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. 
So relative to this angle, the opposite side is uh, Vy. The adjacent side is Vx. The hypotenuse is V. So therefore, sine theta is equal to Vy divided by V. Solving for Vy, just multiply both sides by V. And so you get the equation for Vy. It's uh, V sine theta. Now you could do the same thing for cosine. Cosine theta is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. So it's Vx over V. And if you solve for Vx, you'll see that Vx is equal to V cosine theta. The last one is tangent. Tangent theta is equal to, notice the O and A part, so it's the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. And the opposite side is Vy, the adjacent side is Vx. Now sometimes it might be helpful to solve for theta. So if you take the inverse tangent of both sides of the equation, you're going to get this expression. The inverse tangent of tangent cancels, so theta is simply equal to the inverse tangent or the arctan function of Vy over Vx. Sometimes you may need to find the angle theta. Now we talked about adding vectors when they're parallel or anti-parallel and also when they're perpendicular. When they're perpendicular you can use the Pythagorean theorem to get the answer. But now what if they're not parallel or perpendicular? How can we add two vectors? So let's say if we have vector a and vector b. How can we add them? So the first thing you want to do is resolve a and b into their components. You want to find ax and you want to find ay. You, want, you also need to find bx and by. Let's say r is the resultant vector or the sum of the two vectors. Once you have the components, add all the x components. So rx is going to be the sum of all the x components. If there's three vectors a, b, c, rx is going to be ax plus bx plus cx. ry is the sum of all the y components. Once you have rx and ry, you can find the magnitude of, of the resultant vector, which is the square root of rx squared plus ry squared. And if you want to, you can find the angle of that resultant vector using this expression. So this is the process that you need to take whenever you're adding two vectors. So let's work on an example. Let's say if this is vector a and it has a magnitude of 100. And vector b has a magnitude of 200. And let's say it's 30 degrees above the horizontal. So first, let's calculate ax and ay. So now you need to know your angles. This is 0 degrees, 90, 180, 270, and 0 is the same as 360. So the angle that corresponds to A is 0 degrees because it's on the positive x-axis. It's directed towards the right. B is at an angle of 30 degrees. So AX is 100 cosine 0. Cosine 0 is 1, so AX is 100. AY is 100 sine 0. Sine 0 is 0, so a y is 0. Because a is in the x direction, there is no y component. Now what about bx? Now bx is at an angle. So bx, I mean b has a, an x component bx, and b has a y component. So to find the x component, it's going to be 200 cosine 30. And make sure your calculator is in uh, degree mode, by the way. So 200 cosine 30 is 173.2. And to find by, it's 200 sine 30. Sine 30 is a half, so this is going to be 100. So now we could find rx, simply add these two values. And we could find ry, which is 100. Now once you have Rx and Ry, draw a new vector. 
So our x, since x is positive, we need to draw towards the right. y is positive, so we need to go up. So r is in this direction. And we're going to find the angle theta. So let's calculate r first. It's the square root of rx squared. So that's 273.2 squared plus ry squared. So the magnitude of the resultant vector is 290.9. Now to find the angle theta, let's use this function. It's the inverse tangent of the y component divided by the x component. And that's uh, 20.1 degrees. Let's try one more example. So let's say if we have a force vector, or well, let's say vector A is 200 directed towards the left. Vector B is 100 directed south, and vector C is, uh, let's say, 150 directed at an angle of 60 degrees above the x-axis. So go ahead and add up these three vectors. Find the magnitude and the direction of the resultant vector. So let's calculate ax and ay. Now a is horizontal, which means that it doesn't have a y component, so ay is 0. A is at an angle of 180 degrees. Keep this in mind. This is 0, 90, 180, 270. Because A is directed towards the west, it's at an angle of 180. If you type in 200 sine 180 in your calculator, you're going to get 0. Sine 180 is 0, and make sure it's in degree mode. Now, if you type in 200 cosine 180, you should get negative 200 because it's in a negative x direction. So ax has to be negative. Now bx is 0 because b is in the y direction. There's no x component. by is negative 100 because it's directed in the negative y direction. Now c has an x component and it has a y component because it's at an angle. So let's calculate cx and cy. So to find Cx, it's going to be 150 times cosine 60, which is uh, 75. And it's positive 75 because, as you can see, Cx is in the positive x-axis. Cy is also positive. It's going up. Cy is going to be 150 sine 60, which is uh, 129.9. So now we can find Rx and Ry. So let's add up all the x components. Negative 200 plus 75 is negative 125. And if we add the y components, negative 100 plus 129.9 is positive 29.9. So now we can find the magnitude of the resultant vector. So it's going to be Rx squared plus Ry squared. So 125 squared plus 29.9 squared. Once you square it, the negative sign will disappear. And you should get a positive result. You should get 16,519 before you take the square root. Once you take the square root of that expression, r is going to be 128.5. It's very close to this answer because this value is very small. When it's too small, it becomes insignificant. So now that we have the magnitude of the resultant vector, let's find the angle. So x is negative. So let's draw a vector towards the left. That's rx. ry is positive. So we need to go up. So therefore, r is in quadrant 2. Now let's calculate theta, which is the reference angle. 
it's inverse tangent ry divided by rx. But for now, ignore any negative signs. Just put in positive numbers. So inverse tan 29.9 divided by 125 will give you an angle of 13.5 degrees. So that is the reference angle, or the angle inside the triangle. Typically, you want to find the angle measured from the positive axis. So, if from here to the negative x-axis is 180, then the angle measured by the purple line is 180 minus 13.5. So it's really 166.5 degrees, which is located in quadrant 2. So that's the angle of the resultant vector measured from the positive x-axis. Now let's spend some time talking about projectile motion. Here's the first type of problem that you might see. So let's say if we have a ball on top of a cliff and it's moving horizontally and eventually it's going to fall and hit the ground. H represents the height of the cliff. And let's say D is the, actually R, is the range that it travels. That's the horizontal distance that the ball travels. Now let's say if it takes five seconds for the ball to hit the ground. How can you calculate the height of the cliff? And also let's say if the ball moves with an initial speed of 30 meters per second. How can you find where it lands relative to the base of the cliff? For this type of problem, there's only two equations that you really need. h is equal to 1 half at squared. This equation comes from this equation, d equals v initial t plus 1 half at squared. d represents the vertical displacement, which is the same as the height. v initial is really vy initial. Because the ball is moving horizontally, the 30 meters per second represents Vx. Anytime you have an object moving horizontally, there is no y component. So Vy is 0. Therefore, Vy initial is 0. Everything in this equation is in the y direction, not the x direction. h is the vertical height, or vertical displacement. And that's equal to 1 half times the acceleration in the y direction times t squared. Now this object is in free fall. It's a projectile. A projectile is basically an object that is under the influence of gravity only. And the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. You can add the negative sign if you want. So this is the one equation that you'll need. The second equation comes from the fact that d equals vt. Now, the horizontal velocity, Vx, is not affected by the vertical acceleration, Ay. The x and y components are independent of each other, so Vx is constant. That's why we can use this equation, since the ball is moving with constant speed in the x direction. The horizontal displacement, dx, is the range, so the range is equal to Vxt. So these are the two equations that you'll need in this type of problem. So let's go ahead and solve it. So to find the height, simply use this equation. h is equal to 1 half at squared. The acceleration is negative 9.8. t is 5. Half of 9.8 is 4.9. And 5 squared is 25. So 25 times 4.9 is 122.5. Now the reason why we have a negative sign is because the ball travels in a negative y direction. So the displacement is negative. But if you just want to find the height of the cliff, make it positive. So the cliff is about 122.5 meters tall. Now what about the range? The range is equal to Vxt. 
and Vx is 30, T is 5. So the ball is going to travel 150 meters towards the right. So it's going to land 150 meters from the base of the cliff. And so those are the main two equations that you'll need for this type of projectile motion problem. Let's try another problem like the one before. So a ball falls off a 200 meter cliff and lands 300 meters away from the base of the cliff. What was the initial speed of the ball? So let's begin by drawing a picture. So we have the height of the cliff is 200 meters. And we know the range. It lands uh, 300 meters away. How can we use this information to find the speed of the ball? Initially, we know the ball was moving in a horizontal direction, so our goal is to find Vx. And we can use this equation to do that, but we got to find t first. So let's use this equation to find the time. So the height of the cliff is 200, and the acceleration in the y direction is 9.8. So 200 equals half of 9.8, which is 4.9, times t squared. So let's divide 200 by 4.9, and that's a 40.816. Then to solve for t, take the square root of both sides. So 6.389 is equal to t. So the ball was in the air for 6.389 seconds. Now we can use this equation. We have the range, which is 300, and we have t, which is 6.389. So Vx is simply the distance that it traveled in a horizontal direction, 300 meters, divided by the time of 6.389. So Vx is equal to 46.96 meters per second. So that's how you can find the speed of the ball as it uh, left the cliff. Another type of problem that you might see in regards to projectile motion is if a ball is kicked from a level surface. It's going to go up and then it's going to go back down. Let's call this position A, B, and C. So if you wish to calculate the maximum height of the ball, you can use this equation. H is equal to V squared sine squared theta divided by 2g. Theta is basically the angle of the ball relative to the ground. So this is the angle theta. V is the velocity vector. This is not Vx or Vy, this is V. So here's V, here's Vx, and this is Vy. So keep in mind, Vx is V cosine theta, Vy is equal to V sine theta. Now to calculate the range, which is the horizontal displacement, you can still use the equation that we mentioned before. Range is equal to Vxt. But you can also use this equation. In terms of V and theta, range is equal to uh, V squared sine 2 theta divided by g. So as long as you have the initial velocity of the ball and the angle theta, you can find the maximum height of the ball and the range that it travels. Now what about the time? How can we calculate the time it takes to go from position A to position B? What equation can we use? The time it takes to go from A to B is simply equal to V sine theta divided by g. Now, if you want to find the total time it takes to go from A to C, you simply need to multiply by 2, because the left side is exactly the same as the right side. The graph is symmetrical at point B. So this is going to be 2V sine theta divided by G. Now, sometimes you may need to use this equation. This equation really comes from that equation. 
at the top, we need to realize that vy is equal to zero. So let's talk about how to derive the equation on the bottom. So we're dealing with the y direction. So we can rewrite it as vy final is equal to vy initial plus ayt. Now, going from a to b, the final position point b, the vertical velocity is zero. And vy initial is simply v sine theta, or v initial sine theta. Acceleration in the y direction is the same as g, which is 9.8. So moving this to the other side, we have negative v sine theta equals gt. So we could divide by g. So we get negative v sine theta divided by g, which is equal to t. And keep in mind, g is really negative 9.8. So the two negative signs will cancel. And ultimately, time should always be positive. So you could just get rid of the negative sign. And that's how you can get uh, this equation. Now, let's talk about how to derive the other equations. So we said that range is equal to vxt. And vx, we know it's v cosine theta. And t, the time it takes to go from position a to position c, it's 2 times v sine theta divided by g. So vx is v cosine theta. And let's replace t with this expression. So let's get rid of this and just simply move this over here. So v times v is equal to v squared. And then we have 2 sine theta cosine theta. If you have taken trig at this point, you know that this is a double angle formula, which you can also look it up on Google. Sine 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cosine theta. So therefore, we have this equation. So the range is equal to uh, v squared sine 2 theta divided by g. So now you know how to derive that equation. Now let's see if we can come up with an equation that describes the height. So let's see if we can derive this equation. So let's draw a picture. So let's travel from position A to position B. So the height is basically the displacement. So what equation will help us to calculate the displacement? What would you say? Here's one equation that we can use. And here's another equation. V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2AD. We can replace d with h, but which equation should we use? Now, we don't have time in this equation. t is not there, so we probably shouldn't use this one. So let's try using this equation. So we know that vy final is 0 at point b. So this disappears. So we have 0 is equal to v initial squared plus 2ad. And a is the same as g. And d is basically the height. That's the vertical displacement. So let's solve for g. So we have negative v initial squared is equal to 2gh. So let's divide by 2g. Oh, by the way, this is supposed to be a 2 here. I forgot about that. So this is going to be, so we have this equation. Now keep in mind, vy initial, this is supposed to be a y, is equal to v sine theta. So this is really negative v sine theta squared over 2g, which is the same as, if you distribute the 2, you're going to get v squared sine squared over 2g. Now you can ignore the negative sign if you want the height to be positive. But that's how you can derive this equation. Now let's
go over the same trajectory that we had in the last example. So let's say the ball goes up and then it goes back down. Now the acceleration due to gravity is always 9.8. But to keep things simple, we're going to round it and use a value of 10. So we're going to say g is 10 meters per second squared, just for this particular example. Now let's say that the initial vertical speed in the y direction is 30. So that's vy. And let's say vx is 5 meters per second. What is Vx and Vy one second later? Now the velocity vector is directed in the upward direction, that's Vy. And the acceleration is opposite to it. Whenever velocity and acceleration are in the opposite direction, the velocity will decrease. The acceleration tells you how much the velocity changes every second. So every second is going to decrease by 10. So one second later, Vy is going to be 10 less than what it was. So it's now 20. Vx is constant, and you need to understand that. For any projectile motion problem where, it's only the, where the object is only affected by gravity, Vx is constant, and Vy changes by whatever the amount of g is. In a typical problem, it changes 9.8 meters per second every second. For this example, we're going to round it to 10. So one second later, Vy is going to be 10. Vx is going to be 5 still. At the top, Vy is equal to 0. Vx is still 5, but I'm not going to write it anymore because I'm running out of space. Now one second after that, Vy is going to be negative 10. Another second later, Vy is now negative 20. And when it reaches back to the ground, just before it hits the ground, Vy is going to be negative 30. So as you can see, the velocity of the ball is the same at the same height. So these two are at the same height. My drawing is not perfect. But whenever the height is the same, the velocity of the ball will be the same. Well, not the velocity. I should say the speed. Because here the velocity is negative, but here it's positive. But the magnitudes are the same. Now notice that when the ball is going upward, that is in the first half of the graph, the velocity is decreasing. Anytime the acceleration is negative, the velocity will always be uh, decreasing. Even when it's going down, as you can see, the velocity is still decreasing because the acceleration is negative. So on the left side and the right side is decreasing. Now what about the speed? On the left side, is it speeding up or slowing down? Whenever the ball is going up, it's going to be slowing down. The speed is decreasing. Now what about when it's going down? It turns up that, I meant to say it turns out that it's uh, speeding up when it's going down. Keep in mind, velocity can be positive or negative, but speed is always positive. So here the speed is positive 10, and then 20, and then 30. Notice that the speed is increasing as it goes down. So it's speeding up. So while it's going up, actually before we talk about that, here's something that you need to know. Whenever velocity and the acceleration have the same signs, that is if they're both positive or if they're both negative, the object is speeding up. Whenever velocity and acceleration have opposite signs, let's say if this is positive and that's negative, or if this is negative and that's positive, the object is slowing down. So now let's analyze it. While the ball was traveling upward, the velocity was positive. The velocity was decreasing, but it was still positive. It was going from 30 to 20 to 10. And the acceleration was negative. In free fall, the acceleration is always negative. It's always directed towards the ground. So because these two have opposite signs, the ball was slowing down. The speed was decreasing. Now, on the right side, when the ball was going down, 
the velocity was negative. It was still decreasing, but it was negative. The acceleration remained negative, and because these two have the same signs, the ball was speeding up. So anytime velocity and acceleration have the same sign, the object is speeding up, but whenever it has opposite signs, it's slowing down. Now keep in mind, the examples that we went over in projectile motion were simply scratching the surface. There's a lot more problems that you'll need to know how to solve in a typical physics course. So just check out my channel and just look for my physics playlist and then you can find a video on projectile motion with a lot more examples. So be sure to check that. But now let's move on into forces. You need to be familiar with Newton's three laws. His first law states that an object in motion will continue in motion unless acted on by net force. And an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted on by a force. So if you have a box, it's just going to sit there. Unless you apply a force on that box, it's not going to move. Now imagine if you have an object that is already moving on a frictionless surface. If there's no forces acting on that object, it will continue to move forever. Now, in real life, there's friction. So, due to friction, friction opposes motion. It's a force that slows things down. So, if you were to roll a ball on a table, it's going to move for a significant amount of time, but eventually it's going to come to a stop. The less friction you have, the longer it's going to keep rolling. If you roll a ball on a rough surface, it's going to come to a stop quickly. Let's say if you try to roll a ball on, a, on carpet, it's not going to roll very far. But now, if you roll it on a smooth surface, it's going to roll for a longer distance. Likewise, let's say if you hit a puck on ice, let's say on top of a lake that's frozen, there's not much friction between the puck and the ice, so it's going to slide for a very, very, very long time until it comes to a stop. Now, if there's no friction, it can move forever. So, for example, in an object in space, there's basically almost no air in space. So if you have an object that's moving in space, it will continue to move forever if there's no other forces acting on it. Now what about Newton's second law? His second law is basically an equation. F is equal to ma. The net force is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. Now if the force is constant, if you increase the mass, the acceleration will decrease. These two are inversely related when the force is constant. If you increase the acceleration, assuming the mass is constant, the force will increase. And if you increase the mass under constant acceleration, the force will increase. So force is directly related to mass and acceleration. But when the force is constant, the mass and acceleration are inversely related. Now, this another law, Newton's third law, which states that for every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. Basically, F of A is equal to negative FB. So let's say if you have a smaller person and a larger person. And let's say they push each other. Let's say this person applies a force of 100 newtons. What force will the other person apply to the smaller person. According to Newton's third law, the forces are the same. They're equal and opposite in direction. Now let's say if we have an astronaut in space and he throws a ball away from himself. So let's say he throws the ball towards the right. Now while in contact, let's say he applies a force of 200 Newtons on the ball. What force does the ball exert on him during contact? According to Newton's third law, the forces have to be the same. They have to be equal, but opposite in direction. So in space, if he throws the ball forward, he's going to feel a force that's going to propel him backward. Now let's say that the mass of the astronaut with his suit is 100 kilograms. And let's say the mass of the ball is only let's say 2 kilograms. What is the acceleration on a person and on the ball? 
Now, if you recall, F is equal to ma. So the acceleration, if we solve for it, it's the force divided by the mass. So we have a force of 200 and a mass of 2. So 200 divided by 2 is 100. So the acceleration on a ball is 100. Now what about the acceleration on a person? If we take the force and divide it by the mass, 200 divided by 100 is 2. So even though the same force is being exerted on the astronaut and the ball, the acceleration is not the same. Because the ball has less mass, and therefore less inertia, it's going to move further away. The ball is going to have a greater velocity due to the large acceleration that was exerted upon it. So the ball is going to fly further than the person. Because the person has more mass, the acceleration is less. So remember, we said that whenever the force is the same, the person or the object that has more mass will have a smaller acceleration. These two are inversely related. So the person, he's going to move backwards, but not as much as the ball as it moves forward. So make sure you understand this concept. Now let's talk about friction. We know that friction opposes motion. And there's two types of frictions that you need to be familiar with. Imagine if you have a large box on a rough carpet and you try to uh, push the box. Initially, as you apply a force, the box won't move. It's going to sit there. And as you increase the force, eventually the box will begin to move against the rough car carpet. Now, once you get it going, it's easy to keep it going. Why is that? Why is it easier to keep the box moving than to get it started, to start moving it? You've seen this effect, but have you ever wondered why? Now, there's two types of frictions that you need to be familiar with. Static friction, which occurs when the surfaces between the, the box and the carpet are not sliding past each other. So when the box is not moving, you have static friction when a person applies a force. Keep in mind, if the person applies a force and the box doesn't move, that means that there's another force that opposes the motion that prevents it from moving, and that is static friction. Now, once you get it to move, static friction no longer applies. Another force is present, and that's kinetic friction. And the reason why it's easier to keep a box moving on a rough car carpet as opposed to getting it started is because static friction is usually greater than kinetic friction. I haven't seen a case where it's not greater, so for the most part it's greater than kinetic friction. To calculate static friction, it's always less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. The kinetic friction is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. We'll talk about the normal force later. But now let's say that static friction can be less than or equal to 100 newtons, and let's say that kinetic friction is equal to 50. Now let's say F is the applied force. Lowercase f represents uh, static friction. Let's make a table so you can understand this concept. So F is the applied force, F of S, static friction, F of K, kinetic friction, and let's say F net, the net force. So if we apply a force of zero, what are the values for F of S, F K, and the net force? If you don't apply any force, there's not going to be any friction. And so the net force is zero. Now, what if we apply a force of 20? What are the values? Will the box begin to move if we apply a force of 20? It turns out that it will not move. Until we exceed the maximum static frictional force, it's not going to move. So what is F of S then? Well, let me tell you what F of S is not. F of S is not 100. Now, if you chose this value, let's think about what this means. 
If the static frictional force was 100, and if the applied force was 20, that means that there will be a net force of 80. That means that static friction would actually push the box towards the left as you try to push it towards the right. And that's not going to happen. So static friction is going to match the applied force until you exceed 100. So it's going to be 20. So if you push the box with a force of 20, static friction pushes back on you with a force of 20. So the net force is 0, it doesn't move. If you apply a force of 50, F of S is going to be 50, the box is not going to move. If you apply a force of 100, static friction will still be 100, and it's not going to move. Now what happens if you exceed the static frictional limit? Let's say if you go past 100, what's going to happen? If you apply a force of 120, the box will begin to slide against the carpet. And once it slides, static friction is no longer present, so it's zero. Now kinetic friction takes over, and it's always 50. So now the net force is a difference of 70. So if you increase it to, let's say, 200, f of s is still zero, the box is sliding, f of k will remain 50. Notice that we don't have an inequality sign, it's always equal to 50. And so the net force is 150. So static friction is the force that prevents the object from moving. And until you exceed the maximum static frictional force, it won't slide. Now once you exceed it, the box begins to slide, and then kinetic friction applies. Now let's say if you have a 10 kilogram block. What is the weight of the block? What's the difference between mass and weight? Mass represents the quantity of matter, whereas weight represents the force of gravity acting on that object. For example, the weight of an object on the Earth, as opposed to the Moon, are not the same. It's different. Now the mass is the same. The 10 kilogram object is going to have the exact same quantity of matter on the Earth as on the Moon. However, the weight will be different. Weight is equal to mg. It's the mass times the gravitational acceleration. Now even though the mass is the same, the gravitational acceleration on the Earth is different from that on the Moon. On the Earth, g is about 9.8. On the Moon, it's 1.6. So the weight of the object on the Earth is 10 times 9.8, or it's 98 newtons. Weight is a force, so it's measured in newtons. On the Moon, it's going to be 10 times 1.6, which is about 16 newtons. So on the Moon, you will feel a lot lighter. Perhaps you've seen astronauts on the moon, they could jump pretty high. It's because the force of gravity is very weak on the moon compared to the Earth. So make sure you understand the difference between the weight force and mass. Now, let's say if we have a, a 10 kilogram block on a table. Now we know that there's a downward weight force that the block exerts on a table. And that weight force, we said it's 98 newtons. Now, if the block is remaining at rest, that means that the net force has to be zero, which implies there's another force that keeps the object from falling down. What is that force called? The table, or the surface, exerts a force of 98 newtons on the block. These forces have to be the same because the block is not accelerating upward or downward, it's at rest. Whenever an object is at rest, and if it's remaining at rest, then that force has to be zero. So these two forces have to balance each other. So the force exerted by the table on the block is known as the normal force. The normal force is always directed perpendicular to the surface. Now how can we increase or decrease the value of the normal force without changing the mass of the object. What would you say? Now let's say g is 10, just to keep the math simple. And let's say we have a 20 kilogram block. What is the weight force? Now the weight force is going to be 20 times 10, which is about 200 newtons. The normal force at this point is also 200 newtons. 
But what's going to happen if we apply a downward force of 80 newtons on a block? Will that increase or decrease the normal force? So before we applied the downward force of 80, the ground had to exert a normal force of 200 newtons to keep the block at rest. Now that we've applied a downward force of 80, the ground has to do more work. Not only does it have to support the weight of the block, but it must supply a force to counteract the downward 80 newton force. So the normal force exerted by the surface is now 280. So that's how you can increase the normal force exerted by the ground on a block, is by applying a downward force on a block. Now what's going to happen if we try to lift up the block, let's say with a rope? So let's say we apply a force of 150 newtons to lift up the block. Now the block is not going to go up because unless we apply a force that's greater than the weight force of the block, it's going to remain on the surface. By the way, the tension force is a force that acts through a rope or a cord. That's all it is. So if the tension force is 150 and the weight force is 200, what's the normal force? The normal force is going to be less. It's only going to be 50 newtons. The block exerts a downward force of 200 newtons, but you're lifting it with 150. So there's a net downward force of 50. And the surface is going to apply a force that's going to counteract that net downward force. Now, what if we have an incline? What is the normal force acting on a block when it's on an incline? The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So it's directed in this direction. On an incline, the normal force is equal to mg cosine theta, where theta is the angle of the incline relative to the horizontal. On a flat surface, if we don't apply a downward force, and if we don't lift up the box with an upward tension force, the normal force is simply equal to the weight force. And we know that the weight force is mg, so the normal force is equal to mg on a flat surface with no other forces acting in the y direction, except these two. But on an incline, it's mg cosine theta. Now, there is a component of the force of gravity that accelerates the block downward, and I'm going to call it fg. This value is equal to mg, but times sine theta. So gravity is going to accelerate it downward. And if friction is present, if the block is moving, you can use f of k. F of k is mu k times the normal force. And you know how to find the normal force. Using the equations that you've learned so far, how can we answer these questions? Go ahead and try it. Feel free to pause the video. So we have an incline. And then we have a surface containing friction. So the box, it slides down the incline, and the distance of the incline is uh, 10 meters. And we need to find the acceleration of the box as it slides down the incline. And the angle of the incline is 30 degrees. So how can we find the acceleration of the box? Now, there's no friction on its surface. So the only force that accelerates it downward is the force Fg. And we know that Fg is equal to mg sine theta. And since it's the only force acting on the box in that direction, that means it's equal to the net force. The net force is always equal to ma. So ma is equal to mg sine theta. We can cancel m. So the acceleration down the incline is simply g sine theta. g is 9.8, and theta is 30. Sine 30 is a half. Half of 9.8 is 4.9. So that's the acceleration of the block down the incline. It's 4.9 meters per second squared. Now what about part B? 
what is the final speed of the box as it reaches the bottom of the incline? So let's think about what we know. It accelerates from rest, meaning that the initial speed is zero. We're looking for the final speed. We have the acceleration and we have the distance. What equation has V final, V initial, A and D? So if you go back to your list of kinematics equation, you know it's this, V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2AD. So V initial is zero, A is positive 4.9, and D is 10. So 2 times 4.9 is 9.8, times 10 that's 98. And the square root of 98 is 9.9. .9. So that is the speed of the box as it reaches the bottom of the incline. Now what about part C? So once the box reaches the bottom of the incline, once it's at this position, it's going to have a speed of 9.9 .9 meters per second. Now at this point, it encounters a rough surface, so there's friction. And we have the coefficient of kinetic friction. It's 0.20. How can we use this information to calculate how far it will travel before it comes to rest? Now, during the second part of the problem, the speed of 9.9 .9 is now the initial speed. When the box comes to rest, the final speed is zero. And our goal is to find D. So if we can find the acceleration, we can find D using the same kinematic equation that we just used. So let's calculate friction. Once it reaches the bottom of the incline, there's no FG. There's no gravitational force that accelerates it downward. On the bottom of the incline, the only force acting on the box is friction. There's no force that's accelerating it. Friction's going to slow it down, bringing it to rest. So therefore, we could say the net force is equal to FK. Net force, according to Newton's second law, is always equal to ma. And we know that the frictional force on a horizontal surface with no other vertical forces applied to it is equal to mu k times the normal force. And the normal force on a horizontal surface is simply mg. So we could cancel m. So the acceleration on this surface is simply mu k times g, or 0.20 times 9.8. 0.20 times 9.8 is about 1.96. So that's the acceleration. And it should be negative 1.96 because it's slowing the object down. It's bringing it to rest. The object is decelerating and not accelerating. So now with the acceleration, we can now use this equation. So we know V final is 0, V initial is 9.9, .9. A is negative 1.96, and D, we're looking for it. So we need to move this term to the left side. So let's make some space. So at this point, it's just math. 9.9 .9 squared is about 98. On the left side, it's going to be negative 98. 2 times 1.96 is 3.92. So negative 98 divided by negative 3.92 is equal to 25. So that's how far the box is going to travel once it encounters the horizontal surface with friction. So don't forget the old kinematic equations. It's going to be needed throughout your course of physics. Now let's talk about energy. There's three forms of energy that you're going to encounter in physics. Kinetic energy, potential energy, and mechanical energy. Anytime an object is moving, if it has some sort of speed or velocity component, it has kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is energy in motion. It's equal to 1 half times the mass times the velocity squared. So here's a question for you. If you double the mass of the object, what effect will it have on the kinetic energy? If you see a question like this, all you got to do 
is plug in the number for m and everything else replace it with a one so the one half just put a one for it v plug in one if you double the mass it's two to the first power the kinetic energy will double if you double the speed plug in two into v everything else just put a one two squared is four so if you double the speed the kinetic energy will quadruple if you triple the speed three squared is nine the kinetic energy will increase by a factor of nine. Now, any time an object has the ability to fall, it has gravitational potential energy. And the greater the height difference between the object and the surface, the more potential energy it has. Gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh. It's proportional to the mass, the gravitational acceleration, and the height. So potential energy is a form of stored energy, whereas kinetic energy is energy in motion. The mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential energy. Whenever you have an object that is in free fall and that is only under the influence of, let's say, gravity, Gravity is a conservative force. Gravity can slow down the object when it's going up, and it can increase the speed of the object when it's going down. So gravity is a conservative force in the sense that it doesn't change the total mechanical energy of the ball as it travels. When the ball goes up, it's slowing down, which means that the kinetic energy is decreasing. However, because the height is increasing, because it's moving away from the, the surface, the potential energy increases, such that the mechanical energy is constant. As the ball falls down, it speeds up, and so the kinetic energy increases. But the height is decreasing, so the potential energy is decreasing. So as it falls down, potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, such that the mechanical energy is constant. So gravity is a conservative force. It keeps the mechanical energy constant. Now, conservative force doesn't really depend on the path taken. So regardless if the ball goes like this or like that, gravity will still have the same effect. Friction and, let's say, an applied force, those are non-conservative forces. Friction will always oppose motion. So friction always act in such a way to decrease the total mechanical energy of a system. An applied force can be used to increase the mechanical energy or decrease it. If the applied force is in the same direction as the motion of the object, the mechanical energy will go up. If the applied force is opposite to the motion of the object, the object slows down and the mechanical energy will decrease. So whenever the force and the velocity are in the same direction, the kinetic energy will increase. The object will speed up. And whenever force and velocity, if they're in opposite directions, the kinetic energy will decrease. The object will slow down. To transfer energy into or out of a system, there's two ways you can do it. Heat and work. We're not going to talk about heat. That's for like thermodynamics. But let's talk about work. Whenever you apply a force on an object, you can increase or decrease the kinetic energy of the object. You can also increase its potential energy if the force is used to increase the height of the object if you're lifting it above ground level. Work is equal to the force multiplied by the displacement. So if the displacement vector and the force vector are in the same direction, work is positive the kinetic energy will increase. If the displacement vector and the force vector are opposite to each other, the work performed on the object is negative. The kinetic energy will decrease. So keep that in mind. Not only is work equal to force times displacement, but work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. That is, it's equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy.
and it's also equal to the negative change in potential energy. This is the work energy theorem. Now let's say if we have a box on a surface and we have a rope and we're pulling the rope with a force. And let's say that force is at an angle and the object is moving this way. So this force has an x component and it has a y component. So the x component is called f of x and the y component f y. If the displacement vector and if the force vector are perpendicular to each other, no work is done. The only time maximum work can be done is if the displacement vector and the force vector are parallel to each other. In such a case, work is equal to FD. So in this problem, we have a force that is not parallel to the displacement vector. F is not parallel to D. However, FX is parallel to D. So therefore, the work is equal to FX times D. And we know F of X is F cosine theta. So therefore, relative to this force, the work is going to be FD cosine theta. Now let's see if we can come up with a problem that connects work and kinetic energy. So take a minute and try this problem. So we have a box and we're applying a force of 100 newtons. And we're going to do so over a distance of 10 meters. So what is the work done on the box? So work is equal to force times distance. That's 100 newtons times 10 meters. So the work done on the box is equal to 1,000 joules. Now what about part B? What is the acceleration of the box? Now, nothing was said about friction, so we're going to assume that there's no friction on this surface. So the only force is the applied force, which means that it's also equal to the net force. And the net force is equal to ma. So we have a net applied force of 100 newtons, a mass of 5 kilograms. So 100 divided by 5 is 20, which is the acceleration. Now what is the final speed of the box? We can go back to our kinematic equation. V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2 AD. We're going to assume that the box started from rest, since no initial speed was given. The acceleration is 20, D is 10. So 2 times 20 is 40, times 10, that's 400. And the square root of 400 is 20. So the final speed is 20 meters per second. Now, let's calculate the final kinetic energy of the box. The initial kinetic energy is 0 because the box started from rest. But to find the final kinetic energy, it's going to be 1 half mv squared using the final speed. So the mass is 5 and the speed is 20. So 20 squared, we know it's 400. 400 times 5 is 2,000, and half of 2,000 is 1,000. So as we can see, the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. The kinetic energy increased from 0 to 1,000 because the work is equal to 1,000. If the initial kinetic energy was 100, the final kinetic energy should be 1,100 the difference between the two will remain a thousand. A box slides down a 20 meter tall frictionless incline starting from rest. What is the speed of the box when it reaches the bottom of the incline? So here's the incline and here's the box. So the height of the incline is 20 meters. Not the length of the incline but the height. And our goal is to find the speed of the box once it reaches the bottom of the incline. What we can do is solve it using conservation of energy. So initially, the only form of energy that we had was potential energy. The object was moving, and at the bottom, it no longer has the ability to fall, so it doesn't have any gravitational potential energy. It only has kinetic energy at this point. The gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh. 
the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So notice that we don't need the mass of the object. If we multiply both sides by two, we're going to get the equation 2gh is equal to v squared. So if we take the square root of both sides, the final speed is going to be the square root of 2 times gh. So let's go ahead and solve it. So that's the square root of 2 times 9.8 times the height of 20. So 2 times 9.8 times 20 is 392. And the square root of 392 is 19.8 meters per second. So that's the final speed of the box as it slides down the incline, or once it reaches the bottom of the incline. Now let's spend some time talking about circular motion, but I'm going to focus mostly on the concepts and the equations uh, instead of word problems. Now, as you mentioned before, whenever the force and the velocity vector are moving in the same direction, the object is speeding up. And when the force and velocity vector are in opposite directions, the object is slowing down. Now, what's going to happen if the force and the velocity vector are perpendicular? Let's say if the force is directed north and the velocity is directed east. What's going to happen? In this case, the object is going to turn. It's going to turn in the direction of the force. Now that the velocity is directed north, what's going to happen if the force is directed west? Well, it's going to turn towards the west. And if the force is directed towards the south, the object will turn towards the south. So if the force is always directed towards the center, the object will remain in a circle. So thus we have circular motion. This force, this center-seeking force, is known as the centripetal force. The centripetal force is not a force itself. It's provided by or caused by other forces. The centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared divided by R. And since F is equal to MA according to Newton's second law, the centripetal force is MV squared divided by R. Now whenever an object moves around a circle, you can also calculate the velocity this way. We know that d is equal to vt for an object moving with constant speed. So v is d over t. The distance around a circle is known as the circumference, which is 2 pi r. And the time it takes to complete one revolution around the circle is known as the period, represented by capital T. The frequency, which represents the number of cycles traveled per second, is 1 divided by the period. One revolution is equal to two pi radians, which is a form of angle measure, and that's also 360 degrees. Now here's a question for you. Consider the Earth and the Moon orbiting the Earth. The Moon behaves as a satellite around the Earth. Now what keeps the Moon in orbit in the Earth? What would you say? Chances are you'll say gravity. Gravity is a force that brings matter together. So the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon pulls them toward each other. Now, if that's the case, what prevents the Moon from crashing into the Earth since it's being pulled by the Earth? Now, the Moon has inertia, and it has the tendency to continue moving towards outer space. Right now, it's like just flying towards outer space. However, the Earth pulls it toward itself. And as we recall, whenever you have a force vector and a velocity vector that are perpendicular to each other, the object is not going to move directly in the direction of the force. Neither is it going to move in the direction of V. Instead, it turns. It's going to move this way. And at this point, the Moon is going to have a velocity vector that is directed towards the west, it's going to feel a gravitational force that pulls it south towards the Earth, and as a result, it's going to continue to turn. 
So these two things balances each other, the tangential velocity of the moon and the gravitational force between the moon and the earth. And that keeps the moon in orbit. So in this case, gravity provides the centripetal force for planetary motion. The force of gravity between two objects is g m1 m2 over r squared. So in our example, we have the mass of the Earth, the mass of the Moon, divided by r squared. r is the distance between the center of the Earth and the center of the Moon. It's not the distance between the surface of the Earth and the surface of the Moon. Now, how can we find the speed of the moon or of any satellite orbiting the Earth? To do that, we need to set the gravitational force equal to the centripetal force. The gravitational force between the Earth and the moon is gm times m over r squared. Now, we know the centripetal force is mv squared over r. But which m is this? Is it the mass of the moon or the Earth? Now, which one is moving in a circle in this picture? The moon orbits the Earth. The Earth does not orbit the moon. So this is the mass of the moon. And V represents the speed of the moon, or the speed of the satellite orbiting the Earth. So we can cancel this particular M, and we can cancel an R. So we're going to have this equation. So what we have left over is G M divided by R is equal to V squared. So the speed of a satellite orbiting any planet is the gravitational constant times the mass of the center planet divided by the orbital radius. That is the distance between the center of the planet and the center of the satellite. So that's how you can calculate the speed of a satellite. Now what about the gravitational acceleration of a planet? We know that the weight force is equal to mg. The weight force is the same as the gravitational force, by the way. And the gravitational force is g m1 m2 divided by r squared. So if we separate one of the masses, we have m times g times m over r squared. So these two are the same. The weight force is equivalent to the gravitational force between two objects. These two masses are the same. Therefore, the gravitational acceleration is equal to this quantity. So the gravitational acceleration of the Earth is g times m over r squared. And let's go ahead and calculate that answer. We know it's 9.8. If you do some research, you'll see that the gravitational constant is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. You can look it up on Google. The mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24. And the radius of the Earth, if I recall, it's 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. So let's go ahead and plug this data into the equation. And you should get 9.799, which is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is the gravitational acceleration of the Earth at the surface of the Earth. So g depends on the mass of the planet and the radius of the planet. If you increase the mass of the planet, the gravitational acceleration will increase. If you move away from planet Earth, if you increase the R value, G will decrease. So as you move further away from a planet, the gravitational acceleration will decrease. So G is not always 9.8. It's 9.8 on the surface of the Earth. But if you move far into outer space, like very far away from Earth, then G will decrease in value. Now, let's say if we have a car that is making a circular turn. 
which tells us that there must be some sort of centripetal force that causes it to turn in a circle. And the centripetal force always points towards the center of the circle. So what provides the centripetal force? We know it's not gravity, so what is it? In this case, whenever a car makes a turn, you need to know that friction provides the centripetal force. Now I'm going to leave it up to you to research it and as to how that works, but make sure you just know that. And it's really static friction that creates it. Static friction is equal to mu s times the normal force. That's the maximum static frictional value. And the centripetal force is mv squared over r. Now, if we don't have a bank curve, if the road is leveled, even though the car is making a turn, the normal force is equal to mg. So in a problem like this, where you have a car making a turn, sometimes they may ask you, what is the maximum speed that the car can safely make the turn? Set these two equal to each other. Sometimes they won't give you the mass because, as you can see, m cancels. So the equation that you need is this. The coefficient of static friction times the gravitational acceleration is equal to the max speed divided by r. So solving for v will give you the maximum velocity or speed that the car can have to safely make a turn without skidding. If it goes too fast, the car may not be able to turn. Instead, it can skid off the road, which is not good. Now what if we have a rope and a ball attached to the rope and it's spinning at a very high speed? What provides the centripetal force that keeps it moving in a circle? Whenever you're dealing with a rope, tension is the force that acts on a rope. So tension provides the centripetal force. The tension force for a ball moving in a horizontal circle is approximately equal to mv squared over r. Now what about a vertical circle? Instead of a horizontal circle. What's the tension force at points A, B, and C? Is the tension greater at A, B, or C? At A, the tension is going to be at its maximum because not only do you have to support the weight of the ball, but the rope must also lift the ball to its new position. So going from A to B, the ball has to lift it up. I mean, the, the rope has to lift up the ball. At point B and D, the tension force is approximately equal to the centripetal force. At point A, the tension force is at a maximum. It's equal to the sum of the centripetal force and the weight force. At point C, it's the lightest. The tension force is the difference between the centripetal force and the weight force. Now, what about if we have a horizontal circle, but if the ball is not moving very fast? You can try this. If you take a ball, attach it to a rope, if you spin it slowly and horizontally, you'll see that it's going to be at an angle. Let me draw this better. If you spin it fast, it's going to be, it's going to appear almost horizontal. But if you spin it slowly, the ball will be at an angle. Now let's say this is the angle theta. So T is the tension force. Ty is the y component of the tension force, and this is the x component. So technically speaking, Tx is equal to the centripetal force. Tx provides the centripetal force, because you can see it's pointing towards the center. Ty supports the weight of the object, otherwise the object will fall. So Ty equals mg. Now, this equation becomes important if the object is not moving fast enough. If it's moving fast enough, Tx is going to be significantly larger than Ty, such that Ty is insignificant, and Tx will be approximately T. So if v is large, tx is approximately equal to t, and that's what we could say t is approximately mv squared over r, only when it's moving fast. If it's moving slow, then you have to find tx and ty separately. 
So if you just want to find the centripetal force, use this equation. Now keep in mind, if you need to calculate t, use this. t is tx squared plus ty squared. So if you want to find a tension force, use the speed to calculate tx. Use the weight of the object to find ty. Then once you have tx and ty, you can plug it into this equation to find t. And if you need to find the angle, use this equation. Inverse tangent ty divided by tx. Now, if you want more practice problems on circular motion, just search my video on it, and you can find it on YouTube. Now, let's move on to momentum. Momentum is basically mass in motion. An object that has mass and an object that is moving has momentum. Momentum is represented by lowercase p. It's the product of mass and velocity. So like velocity, momentum is a vector. If an object is moving towards the right, the momentum is positive. If it's moving towards the left, the momentum is negative. The next equation that you need to know is the impulse momentum theorem. Impulse, I'm going to use the symbol I for impulse. Impulse is equal to force multiplied by time. So it's newtons times seconds. Momentum, we said was P is equal to mv. So the units for momentum is kilograms times meters per second. It turns out that the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So you have this equation. So let's say if we have a wall and there's a two kilogram ball, it's moving at a speed of 30 meters per second. It strikes the wall and it bounces back with an equal speed of 30 meters per second. So, now let's say the contact time, that is the time where the ball and the wall is in contact, let's say it's 0.1 seconds. What is the momentum of the ball before it strikes the wall? So momentum is mass times velocity, 2 times 30, so it's positive 60. Now what's the momentum after it collides with the wall? Notice that the velocity is negative 30 because it's moving to the left. So the momentum is 2 times negative 30 or negative 60. Now how can we calculate the average force exerted by the wall on the ball? The wall exerted a force towards the left because the object changed direction and went from moving from the right to the left. So we can use this equation to figure out the answer. The impulse momentum theorem. So the change in time is 0.1 seconds, the mass is 2, and the change in velocity. The final velocity is negative 30, the initial velocity is 30. So final minus initial, negative 30 minus the initial of positive 30. So that's a change of negative 60. So it's 2 times negative 60, which is a change of 120. And as you can see, the momentum changed by negative 120. It went from positive 60 to negative 60. So F times 0.1 is equal to the change momentum of negative 120. Negative 120 divided by 0.1 is equal to negative 1200 newtons. So the force is negative because it's directed towards the left. And so that's how you can find the average force exerted by an object. Now that equation comes from Newton's second law. F is equal to ma. And if you recall, the acceleration is the final velocity divided by the initial velocity over the time, which is really the change in velocity divided by the change in time. So if you replace a with uh, delta v divided by delta t, all you need to do is multiply both sides by delta t so that these two will cancel. And now we have the impulse momentum theorem. So the force multiplied by the time 
is equal to the change in momentum. So now let's think about that. So F multiplied by delta T is equal to the change in P. So if we divide both sides by delta T, we can understand the definition of force. So force can also be defined as the rate of change of the momentum. So it's the change in momentum divided by the change in time. Now let's say that we have two objects, object one and object two, and they collide. What is the effect on the total momentum of the system before the collision and after the collision? What would you say? Now there's two types of collisions, an inelastic collision and an elastic collision. For an inelastic collision, the kinetic energy is not conserved. However, momentum is conserved for any collision. So the total momentum before is equal to the total momentum after the system. That is the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two is equal to the momentum of object one after the collision, so that's V1 final, plus the momentum of object two after the collision. So this little apostrophe here um, tells you that it represents the final speed after the collision. Now for elastic collisions, momentum is still conserved. So this first equation uh, still applies for elastic collisions. So you can use it for any collision. However, you can also use another equation. For these type of problems, you may have to solve it using a system of equations. Here's the second equation. V1 plus V1 final is equal to V2 plus V2 final. This equation comes from the conservation of kinetic energy. And you can only use it during elastic collisions. So for an elastic collision, you can use both of these two equations. But for an inelastic collision, you can only use the equation below. So here's a problem. Let's say if there's a box at rest, and it's a, a 10 kilogram box, and a bullet is fired at the box. Now the bullet has a mass of 0 0.01 kilograms, but it's moving at a very high speed, let's say 500 meters per second. Once the bullet strikes the box, the bullet is embedded in the box and they move together. Typically, when two objects collide, and if they stick together, it's usually an inelastic collision. If they bounce off, most of the time it represents an elastic collision. What is the final speed of the bullet block system after the collision? So we can use this equation, M1V1 plus M2V2 is equal to M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. However, since the bullet and the block move at the same speed because they move together as one unit, these two are the same. So we can just write M1 V final plus M2 V final. Or if we factor out V final, we could say it's just M1 plus M2 times V final. So let's go ahead and calculate the final speed. So the mass of the bullet is 0 0.01. The speed is 500. The block is initially at rest, so it has no momentum. The total mass is 0 0.01 plus 10, or 10.01. So the final speed is going to be 0 0.01 times 500, which is 5, divided by 10.01. So the final speed of the bullet and the block is going to be 0.5 meters per second. It's really 0.4995, but I'm going to round it to 0.5. Now I'm briefly going to review rotational motion. I won't go too deep into it just some equations and some simple concepts. Imagine this is the top view of a door. If we apply a force 
on this door, the door is going to rotate. And this action created by the force is known as a torque. The torque is the force multiplied by the lever arm. The lever arm is the distance between where you apply the force and the axis of rotation. So torque is equal to F times L. Now, if there's an angle, it's also equal to F times L times sine theta. Now, there are some other equations to know. What is the difference between linear speed and rotational speed? Linear speed tells you how fast an object is moving forward. Rotational speed tells you how fast an object is spinning or rotating. Rotational speed has the symbol omega. You can use rotational speed or velocity, but typically just rotational speed. Now, all of the kinematic equations that you've learned before for translational motion, that's like linear motion, is similar to rotational motion. For example, I'm going to make two columns, linear and rotational. At constant speed, we know that d is equal to vt. For rotational motion, distance is represented by theta. Theta is the angular displacement. This is linear displacement. So theta is equal to omega times t. V is the linear speed. Omega is the rotational speed, also known as the angular speed. Now we know that V final equals V initial plus AT whenever you have constant acceleration. Omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha t. A is the linear or tangential acceleration. Alpha is the angular acceleration. And then there's this equation. V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2AD. And here you have another similar equation. So you need to know the counterparts in each of these equations. And there's also this one. D is equal to 1 half V initial plus V final times T. And here omega is 1 half. I mean, ang I mean theta, excuse me, <laughs> is 1 half omega initial plus omega final times t. Now, there are some more equations. There's also this one. d is equal to v initial t plus 1 half at squared. And so the angular displacement is going to be omega initial plus t plus 1 half alpha t squared. Now we know that uh, work is equal to force times displacement. Rotational work is equal to torque times angular displacement. Linear momentum is mass times velocity. Angular momentum is inertia times angular velocity or angular speed. Now, just as alpha is the rotational equivalent of A, you have this equation. Linear acceleration is alpha times r. So alpha is the rotational equivalent of a. Omega is the rotational equivalent of v. So v is equal to w times r. And it turns out that theta is the rotational equivalent of d. Displacement is equal to angular displacement times r. Those are some other equations to know. But interestingly, l is equal to mv times r if you like rearrange the equations. Now you might be wondering, what is I? I represents inertia. And inertia is different depending on the types of shapes that you have. It changes. For instance, for a disk, the inertia is 1 half mR squared, where R is the radius of the disk and M is the mass. For a sphere, the inertia is, I believe, 2 over 5 mR squared. So the inertia doesn't just depend on the mass only, but it depends on how the mass is distributed. And there's some more equations that you need to know for inertia, but those are the two common ones for a disk and for a sphere. 
So these are the main equations that you'll see in uh, rotational motion. And there's also uh, energy. Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Rotational kinetic energy is 1 half inertia times omega squared. As you can see, these two are similar. So inertia, you can view it as the rotational equivalent of mass, just as omega is the rotational equivalent of linear speed. So I'm going to stop here for today. Just want to give you an intro into rotational motion. And so that's it for this video. So keep in mind, if you need to find more physics topics or examples and practice problems, just check out my channel. You'll find my physics playlist on it. So if you really appreciate this video, feel free to comment below, like it as well. Feel free to subscribe to my channel, share it with your friends, or if you like, you can also donate at my channel page. So thanks again for watching and have a great day. And I wish you well on any exams that you have to take.